hundred percent agree. And ultimately, you know, our industry is what it is. It's not going to change. And it's, it is, it is what it is because of all the players in it. It is low barriers of entry. It is a business where the largest companies are dog eat dog, 50% commission salespeople fighting each other. Be a little more vulnerable, says today's Ask an Expert, when questioned on what he would do differently when starting out his career. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propella Media, and today I sit down with Joseph Salmer. He is the founder of a promotional products marketing agency called Whitestone Branding. Today we're going to talk about the importance of using promotional products as a lead gen strategy. We're also going to talk about how you can look at different KPIs to measure the effectiveness of promo products. And finally, we're gonna talk about how you can use promo products in a working remote based environment that we're all in today. If you like Joseph's episode, do us a favor, hit the like button, add a comment down below and make sure to subscribe. That way you're instantly notified when we drop our next episode. Now let's hear what Joseph has to say. Joseph, thank you so much for coming on our Ask an Expert show. I'm pleased to be here, thanks for having me. All right, so I'm a big fan of origin stories. So I'd like to talk about Whitestone's branding's origin story and how that company came about. Absolutely. Let me also turn off my Slack. I thought uh, I muted these alerts. Um, so my origin story, I wanted to own restaurants in high school. I went to culinary school uh, to be a chef. I went to Johnson and Wales and I worked in a restaurant, absolutely hated it. And I thought, oh man, what am I going to do with my life? I committed to college to be a chef and I was a little lost. I was 19. I was at summer camp. Uh, this was in between, um, you know, I had actually just quit my restaurant job. I met a guy selling promotional products from his Blackberry and he was my co-counselor. All the counselors were, were in their young twenties. I was 19. He was in his late forties. And I was like, who the hell are you? Right. You're my co-counselor. All you're doing is just taking calls on your BlackBerry. But what I learned was that he was running a really successful promotional products business from his cell phone. And I just thought to myself, like, this must be easy. If he could run this business from his cell phone, there, there's, there's nothing to it. But ultimately, what I really learned was that promotional products allows you to work with all types of businesses, sure. mom and pops, Fortune 100s. And I saw all the products that he was making for Tequila Patron. And I just thought to myself, wow. If he could do this, so could I. And I went back to school. I declared my major entrepreneurship and I started building my business plans uh, right then and there. And I started Whitestone soon after graduating college. Okay. Um, well, big shift, restaurateur chef to, uh, to business owner of uh, Promo Products. Um, what was it like in the early days of starting something, especially you're just out of college, right? So I think a lot of us, when we think about starting a business, you know, see pitfalls and challenges, but you're just fresh out of school. Is it enough that you're just naive? And so like, hey, let's just go do it. Yeah, there, there was a lot of naivety there. I, I don't think I had my parents buy in to start this thing. Um, so I really felt that I had to prove my family wrong. I had to prove to myself that I could do it. And the early days were tough. I, I, I remember for the first year, I think I asked everyone, will you be my first order? Even though I, I had plenty of orders, but you know, I, I looked young, I was young. And so I, 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 I wore that on my sleeve, but also I felt really insecure about it. Um, the insecurity was really would people trust me with their $50,000 order? Right. Would people trust me with uh, their, their marketing initiatives? And so you know, that insecurity really fueled me to work harder, be more creative, offer a higher level of service, and ultimately, you know, not take no for an answer and, and win on merit, merit alone. Um, but the early days were rough. I, I remember um, I had this grand vision that I would be working with my favorite sports teams, the, the Washington Nationals, and, and they actually, they were my first sale. But, you know, quickly after selling the Nationals, I, I, I hit ground zero. I, I had this, you know, this vision that I'd be selling to the, uh, the Apples and the, the Teslas yeah. of the world. But really, I was selling to, you know, Bob's Bakery. <laughs> and I was selling to the CrossFit gym down the street. And ultimately, those are not the kinds of clients that you want to work with or scale a business with. Yeah, and right. you know, 
I'm, we're, we're very numbers driven. And, and in the early days, I was very cognizant that, you know, did I want to grow my business to be a thousand sales to get to a thousand sales at a thousand dollars to get to a yeah. million bucks? Or did I want 10 customers Ten. doing a hundred thousand a year yeah. doing a million bucks? And so there was a lot of identity crisis in the early days, selling to everyone, but not wanting to be selling to everyone. Um, and that, that was, that was a big struggle early on was onboarding the types of clients that would fuel growth. Well, so I, I like this concept because, right, you know, 10 clients to get to a million versus a thousand, much more scalable, uh, much better, deeper relationships with those clients. Um, how often, t- before you get to that point, is the secret saying no, getting comfortable to turning away business? Yeah, that was a muscle that I had to learn how to flex. Was right. No. Um, I did not have that muscle early on. I, I don't I think, think a lot of us do. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, it's counterintuitive, especially as you're, you're hungry and you're starving a little bit. So yeah. saying no to business is, is a challenge. Yeah, and you don't even go to the gym to flex that muscle because it's just so, <laughs> so clueless that you can even say no to people. And I think ultimately going through the trial and error to learn who were not ultimately fueled us to become who we are. Okay. Um, but those were challenging times early on. And um, I think it really helped fuel us today. You know, we, we don't onboard customers that won't spend $20,000 with us. Right. Every offsite, I tell my staff, you know, write down three buyers that you cringe when you get an email from them. Because ultimately, if, you, if, you're, if you don't want to reply back to an email, you don't want to work with that client let's not work with those clients. Let's weed out those bad customers. And so, yeah, we have the luxury of doing that today, but early on it was, um, it was working with those clients that ultimately would take advantage of us. And I think one of the things that I look back at early on, and I I was talking to someone about this the other day was I didn't have even the confidence to price things. I didn't even know my own self worth. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I would do fulfillment in my apartment, but you know, now I would never, I don't bring boxes into my house. I would never do that. Right. But you know, a young me wouldn't even know how to even tell a customer, Hey, fulfillment's X, Y, and Z price. And we do it at a third party fulfillment center. Yeah. Um, so, you know, early on, I, I, and I think you have to just learn this through experience, but it's just creating that acumen and just growing that savvy and that confidence. And, and, and I think, you know, starting out entrepreneurs in their twenties, early twenties, you're going to have to learn those mistakes on your own and go through that experience because that's just stuff they don't teach in the college textbooks. And, um, you know, ultimately I I tell a lot of young people go, if if you want to be an entrepreneur, go work in a small business and just see what a small business is like, because you're you're not going to get that experience in a textbook. Right. Well, so let's go about that uh, first client, Washington Nationals. Um, so you hit a home run coming out of the gates. How'd you land a, a, an organization like that? Yeah, I love that story. I, I cold called everyone and their mother at the Washington Nationals, including the, uh, the foundation. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I cold called the foundation head who happened to be, I think, a family member of the Lerner family. And she referred me to a gentleman named Jorge Fajardo and Jorge um, was the sweet uh, manager. And so what I produced ultimately was a gift for sweet season ticket holders. And I, I think that I annoyed her by cold calling and leaving so many voicemails that she said, Jorge, just talk to this guy. He means well, get him off my plate, please. Sure. And ultimately I think, I think um, Jorge saw that I was hungry and I was tenacious and he gave me an opportunity. But early days, I was a cold call fiend. I remember uh, one of my first days in business, I cold called uh, the CEO of Verizon Wireless at the time, Lowell McAdam. And uh, I got on the phone with Lowell and he made an introduction to me. And I just remember thinking that, wow, day one, I can get Lowell McAdam on the phone. Who else can I get on the phone? And I was very confident early on that I could open any door myself. Sure. But the problem that I found really quickly was that enthusiasm really only gets you so far. You need to be able to deliver. And ultimately, 
you know, yeah, I could deliver, but my business didn't look like what it does today. Yeah. I had a crappy website. I, I had a cookie cutter site like what everyone else in the industry has. And I didn't look the part. And so I had to rebrand my business. You know, I was Whitestone Works. Now we're Whitestone Branding. My old logo was a lighthouse that looked like it was a financial services firm. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of this self-discovery happened over time. Um, and, you know, those are lessons that you just learn as you go. Sure. Um, and the Washington Nationals, I was fortunate to get that sale. But, you know, after that, nothing really that exciting happened for another couple of years. Okay. Well, let's talk about this, this evolution. Um, what was, obviously cold calling was a strategy for growth, you know, coming out of the gates. What were other marketing initiatives that you were doing then? And how has that evolved to where you guys are at today? Yeah, great question. There was really no initiative back in the day. It was, okay. maybe I did things, but they didn't pan out or they, they didn't have a lot of strategy or thought behind them. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a great example. My first office was at a WeWork and I thought, let me introduce myself to everyone in my WeWork and I'm going to give them a tumbler uh, because everyone was using um, plastic cups. And I thought, you know, let me just give everyone a tumbler with my logo on it so they don't have to, you know, throw away single use plastic cups. What I realized was that everyone started calling me for swag and I started onboarding all the wrong kinds of clients. I started onboarding people that wanted 10 t-shirts for their company. It was like, the last thing I want to do is work with WeWork customers. And so, you know, had I known that, I wouldn't have spent $1,000 to buy that cup to make an impression. Yeah. And so, you know, playing in the right sandbox, I, I put myself in the worst kind of sandbox, which is small businesses. Yeah. I hate yeah. working with small businesses. Small business people, I love you. I am your tribeman. I will talk to you for days about strategy, but I just don't sell my promotional products to you. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of that trial and error, um, early on, it was cold calling. I love cold calling. Um, now I haven't made a cold call in years because cold calling is just not good use of time. Yeah. Um, you know, Whitestone now, we, how we market our business is um, through a lot of sequenced email campaigns. Okay. Um, we, we subscribe to Zoom Info. For anyone that wants to buy lists, Zoom Info, I wish I had. Um, That's where uh, it's at. Yeah, I wish I had a referral code for you because, man, Zoom Info is the place to be. Yeah. Zoom Info is about a $15,000 entry level product um, where we export lists. There is a, um, there's a more cost effective product called Apollo, Apollo.io. Okay. Um, that is another great product to pull lists from. And, and we just, we use a lot of, um, a lot of email sequencing to go get new clients. Pre COVID, we did a lot of, um, prospecting kits over the last two years. Um, is this video, are people going to watch this? They're going to watch it. So one of the kits that we we've done is, um, a, uh, a see us working together campaign. So we'd send a box saying, Hey, you know, we love your company. Can you see us working together? Sure. And then we'd, we'd send a view master. Ah, yeah. to do that. You know, this stuff works. We do a lot of prospecting kits. Um, I'll tell you last year, I'm very numbers driven. Um, I delivered 20 pizzas, like pizza boxes, and we added $700,000 to the bottom line by delivering pizzas in an attempt to get a slice of their time. So yeah. um, I identified a, a target market that we work really well in. We work a lot with experiential marketing agencies and a lot of them experiential marketing agencies don't, they're not in like one world trade center. They don't have big gatekeepers. So I would just go and deliver a pizza and uh, land meetings and that really worked. Um, and so we scaled that down and I'll show you what we realized was we can't deliver pizzas to offices in San Diego or to people in Chicago. So we scaled it down to a pizza box that could be delivered. And on the inside of the box was um, a pizza cutter that says how I cut carbs and a, uh, a pizza stress reliever that says, um, let me get a slice of your time. Sure. Prospecting kits have really helped fuel growth for us. Um, 
And when we're not mass emailing, we are sending prospecting kits. Um, so mass email, prospecting kits, and um, customer referrals has really fueled our growth. Okay. Well, so let's talk about this year because it's been a doozy. Um, what has this year been like for you guys? March through, I'm sorry, January through March, we flew out of the gates. I thought we would have our best year ever. When COVID hit, we were down 98% year over year in April because ultimately what we produce helps fuel live events. You know, yeah. that's so much of our business. So we were demoralized, but we're a business that has the ultimate belief in ourselves that we can go get new clients. And so we pivoted. April and May, um, we started going after facilities managers, trying to sell masks, branded masks, okay. and um, sanitation stands. You know, we realized that just wasn't for us. We're not an organization that, we love making swag, but what we realized was we don't love masks. We're not passionate about masks. Yeah. And, you know, masks are here to save you from coronavirus. Yeah, they're good advertising, but like, we just couldn't as a company and as a culture really get motivated yeah. to sell masks. There's, I know some business owners that have, you know, we're doing a million dollars last year, we're now doing three to five million this year because they got on the mask train. We realized early on that, yeah, we could make a lot of money doing that, but it's just not, it's just not going to fulfilling. It just wasn't fulfilling. And so yeah. we, um, we pivoted to conference and event kits. Okay. And that's been really good for us. We, uh, we attended our first trade show this year. Uh, we met with a lot of event managers and have really um, fueled our pipeline uh, doing conference and event kits. And we were able to fill our pipeline through Zoom info and Yesware and, and mass emailing. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to send a lot of um, our prospecting kits, but we were able to send a Whitestone kit, a Whitestone customer appreciation kit, which really helped us um, reconnect with our buyers in this weird remote world. Sure. And um, that kit was uh, very well received. It was an, um, yeah, that, that kit was uh, an out of this world kit. And it really, I think took people and, and well, I think it really made them feel good about um, just life. It, 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 it put, put a smile on people's face. Yeah, well, that's certainly uh, certainly appreciable this year uh, because there's a lack of smiles. Um, I'm curious, these events and conference kits that you're talking about, I mean, conferences are, I mean, few and far between right now. So what exactly is this kind of vein that you found that is still apparently making you guys thrive? You know, it's, it's bringing the experience of the conference to people's front doorsteps. Okay. A lot of times com companies that are putting on conferences have a tribe. I'm thinking of a company called ManyChat that we just built a, 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 um, a swag conference kit for. It. And this company, every year their conference is in person, but this year it had to be remote. And so to create some buzz and excitement for the event, they created uh, a swag box that when you signed up early, you would get the box. Okay. Um, and the items in the swag kit were shared on social media. They had a hashtag. If you signed up for, um, I don't know the full levels because I wasn't involved, but if you signed up early, you got a sweatshirt. If you were a, a premium sponsor, you got a little something extra in the kit. So, you yeah. know, the kit really built some buzz before the event and was sure. talked about prior. Um, and ultimately that's what a lot of these kits are doing. We're seeing a lot of event professionals creating a lot of different kinds of experiences yep. as part of the event or conference week. Some of them are like wine and sommelier tastings, or, or I'm sorry, wine and whiskey tastings in the higher sommelier. And so we will produce a swag kit that is wine themed with stemless wine glasses and uh, several smaller bottles of wine in the box. And so when the sommelier comes, you already have your your wine and your glasses and you're ready to have that experience. So we're really sure. bringing that experience to the front doorstep. Okay. Um, 
there's a lot of talk about Zoom fatigue, and I don't buy it. I, 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 for, I love this world that we're in. I don't like it from a culture standpoint because I miss being with my team, but I love the ability to digest content at my own pace and sure. when I want. And I, I think now that there's more content out there. And so I don't like this word Zoom fatigue. And it is something that comes up a lot. And I think swag really negates that. If yeah. you get a swag kit for an event that you're spending $100 to attend a week prior, you are now going to be invested and you are going to have that date circled on your calendar. And that's a problem that a lot of attendees and a lot of event professionals who are putting on this, yeah. these events have is people are in their home offices at a conference and their colleagues forget that they are not present, that they are that they have spent money trying to attend this conference. And I think that swag kit is that reinforcement that you are supposed to be present. You are supposed to be engaged, you know, engaged. And, yeah. and ultimately I think that swag kit is that insurance policy for those event professionals to get their attendees engaged and ready to be fully present and tell their teams that, Hey, I am not going to be present. Tell their families, Hey, I can't take the kid to the park today. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm at a conference this week. I'd be in Chicago, honey. I'm sorry. I'm still in the living room, but I'm not present. I need right. to be engaged. And so I think the swag kits have really done uh, a lot of good for those event professionals who are trying to reallocate budget and create that excitement for those events. Well, and that's, my, yeah. That's Fantastic. I mean, I, I love the concept of it. Um, so kudos for you guys uh, for helping evolve a evolving space because I think it is still evolving, but you've put traction um, to, to a space that I think needed it. Um, all right. So want to go into a quick fire round, uh, hit you with a, a couple of questions real quick. Uh, favorite podcast that you're listening to right now? I love Freakonomics. All right, good one. Um, who is your professional inspiration? Gosh. You can name a few if you want to. You don't have to, you know, just say this is the, the pinnacle. You can do a Mount Rushmore. Yeah. You know, I love Gary v Vaynerchuk. Hmm. You know what Hard I love not to love. Him? Yeah. I think he gets a lot of flack from some people who don't really understand him. But the one thing that Gary does I think is that he generally cares about his audience and he really wants to empower his audience to test things, trial and error, be vulnerable. I think he leads with empathy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I've actually had the pleasure of, of, of being at his offices and I see his, I've seen his people, I've seen his culture, what he speaks, he lives and breathes. And it's hard not to admire a guy that wears his heart on his sleeve and is really trying to, um, just spread the good Goodness. word. Yeah. yeah. I, I think a lot of people on the outside looking in do think that it's a shtick and they don't realize how authentic. Um, and, and if you've been following it for years, you, you know it, you, you feel it. I mean, it, it, is, it is about as authentic as I think I've actually seen anybody. Um, yeah. And I've, I've been introduced to a lot of people this year for this show. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe next year we'll have him on, but he, he is the real deal. He really is. And I'm, I'm really inspired by him. Actually, there was, um, he spoke at a, an event for entrepreneurs organization I was on last week. And he must have said this five times, you know, when asked, like, what's the number one piece of advice you could give? Over and over again, he said this, and it really inspired me. He said, putting out pictures, videos, written words, and distributing them across the 15 social media platforms is going to be how you win in business over the next five, 10, 20 years. And that really inspired me. And it really made me think about what am I doing to create content and spread the word about Whitestone in a different way. And um, I, I think he's right. And he's been right for a long time. And I think you're right by doing what you're doing with your podcast. And um, Gary is someone that I aspire uh, to be just 5% like. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good aspiration. And 5% is, is a lot when it comes to Gary Vee. Um, favorite book, either that you're reading right now or, or one that's on the, towards the front of the line on the bookshelf. I love uh, Jim Collins, Good to Great, How the yeah. Mighty Fall. 
Uh, I remember um, reading that in college and everything that he talks about innovation, the flywheel, it, 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 it all makes sense and it's all applicable in your business. Uh, so I, I really like Jim Collins as an author. Um, yeah, okay. that's what I would say. Okay. Uh, um, I, I do want to add too, um, traction, entrepreneur operating system. I, I, um, I do think that um, entrepreneurs, any entrepreneur would find value in the book Traction. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, early to bed or, uh, excuse me, early riser or midnight oil. Uh, which, which one do you lean towards? Man, I thought I finally conquered the early riser this year, but I'm a midnight oil guy. I, okay. I will. I find that I get my best work done between the hours of 8 PM and 2 AM. I think, okay. um, you know, that's one thing too, that I, I, I really do think about that. Um, two hours a day extra. If you work a 10 hour day, for a calendar year, you actually work 13 months out of the year. Right. And I really try and get ahead by working at night. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. Um, I, think that, I think that what this year has taught me is that you need to be appreciable to what your environment is and how you are actually working in it. I do think that I have historically been an early riser, and I still am. And I still, you know, do get up early. Um, but productivity wise, I found that it's becoming more afternoon. And, and I, I, I felt I resisted that, but it's like, no, this is, this is where it's happening. So follow productivity. Um, but you have to be aware of it first. Um, all right, last, last quick fire. Uh, favorite pizza topping? Uh, I, uh, I eat a vegan diet. So just uh, <laughs> anything vegetables with no cheese. Okay. You get, you're going with uh, the Dea cheese? I, it's okay. It's yeah, right. it, it's, it's not the real deal. So I hear you. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, let's jump back into it. Um, as far as promotional products industry as a whole, what do people get wrong about promo products? Um, yeah, there's a lot I could talk about there. We got time. Yeah, you know what I would say that there needs to be a why. Why are you buying promotional products? I think promotional products is one of the most underappreciated and undervalued advertising channels. And it can be the most rewarding channel if done appropriately. And I wish buyers would allow promotional products distributors and, and the people that they work with to have a seat at the table and allow us to talk about our product in the terms of marketing. And that's what I think Whitestone does. We look at ourselves as a marketing agency right. that uses promotional products to achieve a purpose. And, you know, we try to educate our clients that, hey, if you call us three days before your trade show and you just need some stuff to be given out, you know, on your booth, we say save your money because we don't want items to wind up in the trash. Yeah. And we don't want you or the people who are receiving the items to have a negative affinity if they are not used the right way. Um, so I think that most people, I shouldn't say people, what, what, what I wish people would do is that, I think, I wish they would open up to learn about and hear about how promotional products can help either convert, nurture, um, and really have a purpose in your marketing mix. Uh, you know, I'll give you a great example. This year, we helped a client with a, um, an appreciation box for their staff. Everyone was yeah. home and they were, you know, they, they, they hadn't been in, in the office in months. So we created a box uh, for a financial services firm. And what we produced was a Patagonia vest. We, we, we did a, um, uh, a plant that you, you would water and it would grow and, and a few other things. And it was really meaningful, really well thought out. And one of the employees said in feedback that they've been at the company for eight years. And this was the first time that they really felt valued. And this was the most appreciated that they felt right. since being at the company for eight years. And that was because of what we sent them. And ultimately promotional products can have that ability to make people feel nurtured, valued, and appreciated. 
But when done wrong, it can be the opposite. And I'll give you an example. My, my girlfriend came home yesterday with her holiday gift from the office, and it was a North Face quarter zip, and it was a men's small, and she's petite, she's an extra small female, and the company just missed the mark. They just ordered a piece of apparel and didn't really put any thought or attention to it. And, you know, albeit that's a $60 piece of apparel, and they're ordering a thousand. That's a great $60,000 order. That's a lot of money, but for $60,000, yeah. you can do so much more than just a North Face vest. You can create something meaningful and thoughtful and well thought out and make people feel an affinity and connection to the brand. And I don't like when buyers feel the need to buy something because they have to. Yeah. I would rather they open up that budget and say, how can we make our people feel valued with this $60,000? Not to say, what's the one item at one price we could get from that $60,000? Right. Um, well, that's, that's interesting. I'm going to go back to a couple of things you, you mentioned earlier. One, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a culinary reference here. Uh, and we'll talk about the clients of having, you know, the importance of having 10 clients versus a thousand. Um, I do feel like promotional products is kind of like the food industry. And I feel like most people's perception is that promo products are fast food, i.e. junk food. And the reality is you can, you can go to a, a high end steakhouse, you know, or, or whatever, you, you know, your palate is, is for, and, you know, to tie in the, the 10 versus a thousand, if you do it in a meaningful way, you are going to get more out of it. And I do feel like people don't consider promotional products as an actual investment. They just see it as an expense on, on the marketing sheet, as opposed to, Hey, what, what's our, what's our ROI on this? Because there can be. hundred percent. And there's, there's a lot of reasons why that is. I have a lot of thoughts on why that is. Um, ultimately, it's the job of companies like Whitestone to be educating the end users and the buyers on the power of promotional products. Right. And I think that's why Whitestone is successful is because we are like the Ruth's Chris Steakhouse of the industry. We deliver white glove service and we ensure that from the second you walk into our business to the moment you leave, you feel that, um, that level of service from the second you walk in. Sure. Now, ultimately, this is a very commoditized industry. Anybody can go on fourimprint.com and go order promotional products. And yeah. I, I actually think Four Imprint has a great place in this industry. Four Imprint, I'm happy they're here. I refer a lot of people that shouldn't be in Whitestone's world to Four Imprint. But and, and I hope there are promotional products companies that are listening to this. And I feel as an industry, it's our job to value our work and not devalue our work by necessarily, I'm going to say two things, just not educating our clients and uh, just taking the money and taking the orders without intent. Yeah. And then the other thing too is um, we as an industry have stopped valuing our creative. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is because we're so competitive, because there are so many places to go for promotional products, for imprints and white stones and, and businesses like ours, we give out ideas for free. And I feel that that's a problem because ultimately, if we don't value our own work and our own creative ideas, what are, well, how, why will our customers? And so you know, these are changes that Whitestone's making in our business to put deposits on creative thinking. Okay. You know, when, when customers come to us and say, hey, we would love to create a appreciation kit for our clients. We want it to be the best kit ever. Here's our budget, $50,000. We don't say, all right, great, here are your ideas. Whitestone says, great. In order to engage, there is a $2,500 deposit budget and with this budget, you are going to get X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. You are going to get creative thinking. You're going to get design services. And we are really going to think about every aspect of this kit, the why, the unboxing experience, 
the products that are in it, what are the meetings that they have. And so that's really the marketing approach we take is yeah. creating that ROI at every, um, every opportunity that we have because ultimately they come to us for a reason. They come to us because they want to ultimately, what is the opportunity? The opportunity is not to create swag. The opportunity is to create loyalty amongst their employees. And how do you do that? through swag it can be through a holiday party it can be through you know hiring a, a badass speaker like gary vaynerchuk to come in and engage your staff and do the rah rah you know and that but that company has decided to do swag rather than a holiday party hey maybe the swag is being given out at the holiday party but sure. ultimately there is a meaning there is a why so let's get to the let's get to the root of the opportunity and and if we know the root of the opportunity, then we can service that. And so that's really what I, I urge and challenge promotional products distributors to really value your work, value your time, and get to the why and put a budget on that. Get a deposit, value your work. And I don't think, and I, I would say 95% of my competition do not ask for deposits or budgets at engagement. And if more and more did that and started to do that, I, I think this business and this industry would be less commoditized. And I do think that end users, buyers would start to have a positive perception with promotional products as a whole. And ultimately we are okay when clients say to us, you know what? We don't want to pay the deposit. We're going to go elsewhere because they're price shopping. Fine. Be a price shopper. I don't care. We're not the price shopping business. Even if it's a hundred thousand dollar opportunity, we are okay. Yeah not price shopping that because that's just not a good fit for us right. and we'd rather be valued and looked at as a partner not as a vendor because vendors are dispensable partners are not that's actually a core value of ours is that we want to be a partner and not a vendor um so i, I love hearing you say that i almost feel like um i think there's nomenclature within your industry that is particularly um i'm just going to say toxic right mm -hmm. I, I, I do think, you know, swag is a word that we throw around and it is just so casually thrown around that the products that we think of are, are associated to that. Um, I do think what you are doing is you are, you're really, I don't know. I'm interested to see how this evolves because I feel like what you are is not a promotional products company. I feel like what you are is a marketing agency that just happens to use, use this channel and you are, um, I'll, I'll use another word, um, distributor. Distributor to me is another word that I feel just demeans because all I'm doing is I'm, I'm reaching behind me and I'm distributing something to you. And you guys are actually like, no, we're going to design something. We're going we're gonna to be creative about that. And I do think that strategy, that why, that is something that no matter whether you really want to go full agency or whether you just want to be conventional distributor, I feel like that will go so much further for organizations in the industry and for the clients that are using it. 100% agree. And ultimately, you know, our industry is what it is. It's not going to change. And it's, it, is, it is what it is because of all the players in it. It is low barriers of entry. It is a business where the largest companies are dog eat dog, 50% commission salespeople fighting each other. So right. ultimately that is um, because of that, I think that's the reason why we are where we are today. But I look at it as a positive for Whitestone because we do know our place in the market. We do know which lane we're in. Yep. And it does make it really clear for us when we are talking to prospects to say who we are and what we want to be and what we're not. Yeah. And, and ultimately, you know, going back to what we talked about in the beginning of the conversation, how would I have ever known that as a 23 year old starting out? <laughs> yeah, right. It's all the evolution and, and Ultimately, we got here because we wanted to be more than just order takers. And sure. we wanted, and, and we want to positively impact the companies we work with through our medium. And that's what's rewarding when we can go and work with big name companies and positively have an impact on their brand and marketing campaigns. That's what we get up for. And that's what motivates us every day. Okay. Well, you've talked about something, you're a big numbers guy, and I do think um, numbers are a bridge 
to make promotional products more um, insightful and, and to have organizations leverage them better. And as someone who's put together probably thousands of KPI reports, um, how do we measure an ROI or what is the, the KPIs that we look at when you're talking to an organization that is giving away something, you know, this unboxing gift um, that they don't necessarily see an immediate benefit. Um, so how, how do you guys um, square that out? Yeah, you know, it's hard to, and, and, and actually, I, I don't know how to answer this, but it's, I think brands need to look at the long game and the yeah. strategy and have that's, a strategy. That's what I was thinking is it's, it's gotta be a long play. It is a long play. And, and ultimately Whitestone, we do things that are long game and it's hard to really justify in the short term, but yeah. it's almost like um, just positive reinforcement. If you're doing, you know, little things, little things, little things, little things, little things, right. Little things, right. It ultimately makes a big difference. And I think sure. swag has a big part of that. And, you know, I can give you a great example and tell you a great story of something that we did once that didn't, turn into anything overnight, but turned into something beautiful a year later. Um, Goldman Sachs is a big client of ours. And I had the opportunity to pitch one of um, a big executive. It was actually through the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business program. So yeah. I was in a room with the executives and we had already been working with Goldman prior to me being in this program. And the one thing we don't do at Goldman is their company store. And the executive who the company store ultimately reports up to was in the room and I had the opportunity to pitch him. And I was wearing a tie that I had made for Goldman. During this pitch, I was wearing my Goldman tie. He came up to me after the meeting and said, God, Joe, I love that tie. Where'd you get it? I turned the tie around and I said, matter of fact, I actually made this for the firm. Here's the label, it says Goldman Sachs on it. And he said, man, what would I do for 50 labels to put on all my ties? My follow-up was I sent him 50 woven tie labels and I sent him a PowerPoint presentation with, you know, the opportunity that I want to come in and pitch to him. I never heard back from him. We actually, we, we, we've had lunch and we, we stay in touch uh, and I have good rapport with him, but I never got that company store. About a year later, I get a call from his direct number two. She left Goldman, went to a hedge fund, a huge hedge fund with 2,000 employees. And she said, Joe, I saw what you did for Dino and the woven tie labels. And I just thought to myself, wow, what amazing service. I'm going to call him when I need him. And ultimately, that became a $200,000 order, a one-time order, and a company store. That was like four years ago. We've kept that company store and it's grown. And so... Ultimately, I can't track the ROI on that woven tie label, but I'm a big believer in gifting and always gifting to leads and prospects. And we have little things, opportunities when we gift and where we gift. And ultimately, it's so hard to track those things. But if you just keep consistent with that, sure, you know, it pays off in the long run. And I know there's a guy named John Runlin who believes in this giftology. Had him on, yep. Yeah, and, and I think taking a little bit of, of John's shtick, you know, how do you be memorable? And I know he has the, 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 the metal business cards. You know, when we try to do that, how do you stay memorable throughout the year and, you know, not gifting at the holidays? And so, you know, a company, a small business, how do you – stay memorable to your clients, a professional services firm. So many people want to give to the holidays. We'll tell them, hey, look, it's December 8th. I got a call about two hours ago from someone in my B&I group. He wants to gift. I said, buddy, you're never going to be able to gift for the holidays. UPS is backed up. Why don't we do something for Valentine's Day when you've been able to think it out and it'll be more memorable and you have time to think it out. I don't want your money now. I don't want to even have a fire drill for your $2,000 order. Let's get our shit together and let's go for a yeah. Valentine's Day play. And so how can you gift really intentionally and, and maybe not when everyone else is doing it? And so um, it's hard really to think about ROI with swag. 
But really, if you're intentional and you're well thought out, there will be ROI that you can measure, but maybe you just can't measure with handing it out at the, your trade show booth. Right. I, I think that I think that there can be numbers. Um, you know, my mind goes to like a retention rate. You know, what is my customer retention rate? You know, um, the the interesting things that you guys are doing right now with the conferences. You know, is there a way to measure engagement of a, a virtual conference? You know, so that we can see people are in fact more. Um, they put a hashtag around it, so now we can go out in the social media. But I think at the heart of it. I do hear what you're saying. And I think there is a feel aspect to this where how do I feel after I'm getting feedback or I'm seeing people? Um, I'm hopeful for you that uh, you'll have a new client next year. That'll be your girlfriend's company um, <laughs> that they can take something a more meaningful because I think that's, that's a perfect example. She's not feeling it. So she's not going to be giving any, you know, good vibe to the company more than she otherwise was. But if they'd done something really creative, they'd done something really thoughtful, you're going to feel that. You're literally going to feel that. And what is the definition of a brand? Branding is what people perceive of your brand and your yeah. image of your company. And, and that's ultimately what swag does it, is it helps people have an affinity and a connection to your brand. And I think there's a stat, 93% of people who received a promotional product in the last two years can tell you the company that they received that product from. People remember who they get the swag from, but they also remember if it was bad swag. So, yeah. you know, be- Is it a good memory or is it a bad memory exactly. that you're-, you're exactly. yeah. Okay, um, what's, let's just talk about the future. And, and I think that we've talked, or you've talked a, quite a bit about it, but I mean, how do you see um, how do you see this industry really evolving? Do you think it's going to you know see the separation between the commodity based products that are your you know go to swag and and more of the agency or is there is there something else a hybrid what, what do you see looking forward? I think that with a lot of uh, Gen Z coming out and taking jobs in the workforce, millennials now are now executives and they're taking leadership roles. Gen Z are now starting to be uh, junior level in people. Gen Z is really at their core thoughtful and caring. They care about the environment. These are traits that market researchers have identified about Gen Z. Gen Z are not going to buy swag if it ends up in the trash. Yeah, that's Gen a good Z point. are not going to buy single use plastics if it goes in the trash. And so I think agencies and promotional products distributors need to realize that millennials, everyone's been talking about millennials, 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 but Gen Z is this new breed that are now entering the workforce and yeah. you need to start caring about what, what, what they care about. And I hope that our industry moves more to sustainability. Um, Sometimes I do have, um, I, I just, I don't like that I'm selling stuff that is sometimes ends up in the trash. Yeah. I'm not going to change my business model because of that. But I do think that the industry is going to become more condensed. I do think that um, there will be a lot of suppliers that go out of business because their products are garbage and trash. Yep. And I think you're seeing that across every industry, you know, Amazon big, get bigger in our world. It's the same thing. The largest suppliers keep getting bigger and bigger, and bigger, and they're absorbing the bad ones uh, or not the bad ones, but they're just absorbing. Yeah. And I think that you're going to see a lot of that, but ultimately this is a business where someone can start, this company or a company out of their home and be successful and, you know, do a couple hundred thousand in sales and, and make a living. So I, I just, um, I think you're going to see swag less being given out at trade shows because they have to. And I hope people are using swag more intentionally and thoughtfully, but also, you know, because events are not live and in person, I think a lot of event planners and HR professionals who are creating beautiful swag boxes to send as care packages to people's homes, 
I think people now are seeing that swag can be used more effectively. And I hope that coming out of Corona and coming out of these lockdowns, that when people go to live events, that they realize that swag did invoke a feeling and really fill that void when people were stuck at home. And I hope that when they come back to live events, that they still ask the right questions to create swag, to create meaningful engagement at live events, because swag can. There are ways you can use branded products at live events to create memorable moments. And um, I, I, I think that people will, um, yeah, I, I think swag will have a big part to play in the future that comes. Well, I, I like that. I, I think that one of the challenges that you will have um, is that, you know, it, we'll just use simple math here. Um, we have a conference coming up and we're going to go to, to normal, normal conference, live, live an event. Um, whereas before I might be able to buy a thousand units of X and X is, you know, it's pens, it's squeeze, but whatever, but it's 50% of it's going to be left in the hotel room. You know, maybe 50% makes it back to the office, but you know, it's garbage. It's not, they're not like good pen, you know, so it is garbage. So now I have a budget. It's like, I feel like the challenge you guys have is you need to be able to get more of the marketing budget because they do see it as an expense. And so it's like, it's a thousand dollars. Well, Hey, if you only have a thousand dollars now, I can only get a hundred meaningful items, but yeah. I'm still going to have 500 people stop by my booth. So what do I do now? Well, I need a bigger budget. I need more of that marketing budget because this is actually more meaningful. And I feel like that's the challenge that, that is facing your guys' industry. Yeah. So I think you hit the nail on the head with that. How can marketers still take that budget if the budget hasn't changed? Say it's $1,000 and you're going to a trade show and you want to exhibit, you know, rather than buying a thousand items at a $1 price point, which is garbage, I call that tchotchke, you know, that, that is where the low perceived value comes from. Buy 50 pieces at a $20 budget yeah. and just be more meaningful and thoughtful. People that come by your booth that actually cared to learn more, that gave you the time to explain your product. Right. Maybe give them a really nice Yeti tumbler that they're going to use. And, yeah. and rather than having a thousand impressions that go nowhere, why don't you have 50 impressions that they have really a go somewhere? Exactly. Yeah. So ultimately, when we look at swag and when we look at every opportunity, we like to try and check off two out of these three boxes. And if you can check out two out of these three boxes, in our opinion, you've had a successful campaign. The first thing is, does the item surprise and delight? Does it create a feeling? Okay. Does it make you feel more connected to the brand? Does it give you a positive feeling and impression about that brand? The second is, are you going to get the item and use it? Is right. it a high quality product? It's not a piece of junk that just ends up in the trash. And the third is, you recognize that it's a high quality product. You're appreciative that you've received it, but hey, if you were given a, a water bottle, but you may already have a water bottle that you love, but you recognize it's a high quality product that you're gonna re-gift it to your significant other or you know, someone close in your life. Sure. Ultimately, if you can check off two out of those three boxes, we believe it's a win-win it's a and a resounding success. And we go into every opportunity uh, really trying to make sure that we check off two out of those three boxes. And so, you know, that fuels us when we have the client that says, hey, I have a thousand dollar budget. I need swag for this trade show. We're able to say to them, hey, will it check off these two out of three, these three boxes? And by Whitestone, having those core beliefs top of mind, we're able to educate our client on how they should be thinking about the product Sure. And ultimately, I think that helps us really um, create loyalty with our clients because they know that we have their best interest and their best, um, yeah, we, we have their best interest in heart when they present us with their budget. I, I love that. I love that you have this, you know, three-pronged stool and saying, hey, it's still going to be standing as long as we have two out of these three. So I applaud you guys for having that approach. Um, 
putting a putting a bow on this um as you look at your career um and it's it's uh it's still it's still growing right uh, you're not i'm not talking to a 50 something you know year old guy that's been around forever um but if you could go back cuz you've built a pretty um a pretty great business that you have there um and you put together a great team is there anything you might have told yourself you know younger you um you know you're going to be Gary V and inspiring younger you what might you have done differently now that uh, you, you've been where you are? You know, I, I have a couple pieces of advice. The first is, and I'm actually struggling with it today. Okay. I wish that I would have kept an accurate Rolodex of all my clients, leads, suppliers, industry friends, business acquaintances over the course of my 10 year career. Yeah. I look now, I have 24,000 emails in a Rolodex that is filled with duplicatives, missed information. And now I just feel like if I, I, I just don't have this Rolodex that I, I wish I, I, I could have, could have had if I started day one. Right. And I wish that I would have kept samples and overruns from my favorite projects and jobs. Like I don't have a trophy case of some of my favorite orders. Yeah. And I, I have a pretty nice Rolodex or I have a pretty nice trophy cabinet of brands and projects that we've worked on. And I, I just wish I would have uh, just better documented some of the things that I would have done. And I think that's applicable for any career in any business, uh, you know, to kind of make sure that you're remembering where you came from. Sure. Um, and then, yeah, going back to Gary Vee, I wish I would have been a little bit more vulnerable to put myself out there as a leader and as a, professional in this space and i'm trying to do that today and um ultimately had i done that 10 years ago um i think i, I could have had a, a bigger personal brand than i do today yeah no i, I think that's good and I, i'm gonna just carry that a little bit because i I've talked to a lot of people this year that um, I think a year ago I would have said I, I have no business talking to um, because I've talked to some really brilliant leaders um, and some really successful people like you. And I think what, you know, you, you go back to the old adage, we all put our pants on one leg at a time, yeah. right? And, and granted, um, your 5% and Gary Vee is a perfect example. I'm not, I'm not as smart as Gary Vee. I know this. I don't have, you know, a lot of the things that he has but we do each uniquely have and bring a lot to the table that I think we undervalue. Yes. And that, that confidence, you can go in that room and you can talk to that director, you know, Goldman Sachs, just, just like you could go in and talk with Gary. Like that is something I, I want more entrepreneurs, especially the young ones to recognize that you do belong in that room. And it, it, it's up to you to figure out how, but you, you belong in that room. You've got a place there. You just need to figure it out. Yeah. And, you know, my, when, I, when I started the business, my, my parents were not for this at all. But, you know, my dad gave me one really strong piece of advice. He said, Joe, from now on, you're an equal to absolutely everybody. I like Whether it. you're in the room of the CEO or you are talking to one of your employees who is on day one on the job, you're an equal to everyone. And um, I think it took me a while to really understand that. Um, and ultimately now, 10 years later, I really, it hit home. And it is something that I really think that we all, especially as entrepreneurs, need to feel equal to anyone in the room, whether they're up, down, or around you. Yeah. Uh, and so well that, said. Yeah. Good, good pops advice there. So. <laughs> Uh, Joseph, I want to thank you for coming on. This has been a really engaging conversation. Um, it's one I, I've always, you know, I, I've never really been in the promotional space, but I've touched it as a client and I've touched it as a recipient. And it's one that has just fascinated me. So I really appreciate your time today. Um, and I appreciate your guys' approach to this and really elevating what I think is, is just an incredible um, space for marketing. Well, thank you so much for having me. It truly means a lot. I am so passionate about this business. I love promotional products. And for all of those listening, next time you look to order promotional products, please, I encourage you to ask your, 
your vendor to have a seat at the table and ask for our opinion. You know, we, we live and breathe this and I'm sure we could bring a lot of ideas that would ultimately help make you the buyer look good to your superiors. And that's what it's all about. It's about creating an easy and enjoyable process and making our customers look good and uh, have some fun while they're at it. Totally agree. Thank you so much, Joseph. Thank you. If you enjoyed Joseph's episode as much as we did, make sure you hit the like button. And if you have any questions, add them in the comment section down below. And finally, make sure to subscribe. That way you're instantly notified the next time we drop our next episode. Hope you guys stay safe and have a great rest of your day.